Hello again, welcome back to Zion Lutheran Church here in Petoskey, Michigan. My name is Pastor Matthew Peters and we welcome you in the Lord's name to this, our video worship service for the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent, March 21st, 21. So we are one week away from Palm Sunday as of this weekend one week away from the beginning of Holy Week and really considering the life of Christ as it comes to its earthly conclusion. And of course, <laughs> it's not really his earthly conclusion if he's alive again when we get to Sunday, is it? With that resurrection comes our hope for eternity, our joy in knowing that just like Jesus' life did not truly end at death, our lives go on as well. Today, though, we're talking about, well, we're talking about the hope of Christ, for sure, but we're also talking about this, um, this idea of forgiveness from the prophet Jeremiah and this new covenant that is established as we see Jesus completing that new covenant on the cross. But also we're talking about humility and what it is to be a child of God, a disciple of God, a follower, but also a somebody who's going to share this love of Christ and how we need to interact with well one another but also the world in a humble and servant-hearted manner. One other thing as we get closer to Holy Week I wanted to just mention on our video here you'll have to call the church office in order to take care of this but our Easter Lily Order forms are in and uh, they are going to be uh, in our bulletins in person of course but if you would like to take part in uh, decorating and beautifying the chancel as we get into Holy Week and Easter Sunday, uh, you can call the church office and you can put in a donation for those lilies as well. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone had that as something they were able to do. So call or email the church office, I suppose. Either one would work. We praise God for your continued support of God's house. And uh, well, let's head on into worship. We begin this day in God's name, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you of all of your sins. 
Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I am able to forgive you of all of your sins in the name of our God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm for today is a selection of Psalm 119. That's the longest psalm, but we're only taking a little chunk. Uh, verses 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. It's a little bit optimistic, this section of Psalm 119, but it is what our hearts yearn for. Yearning for not just the forgiveness of God, but succeeding in his ways and doing so by listening to his word and internalizing even the commandments, which sound like they're so harsh, but we know that that's the will of God and God's will is good for us. And so we, we approach God with this attitude, repentant hearts that have been forgiven, and now, O oh Lord, help us to continue in your ways. So let's go and approach God and his altar. We join in the responsive Kyrie and then pray our collect prayer for this Sunday. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. And our prayer for the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in both body and in soul. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, he who lives and who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the prophet Jeremiah. As I mentioned at the beginning of our service, this is a uh, important prophecy for many reasons. Mainly, though, it talks about this idea of a new or renewed covenant, new terms of an agreement between God and his people. We see that playing out at the Last Supper with Jesus taking the bread and taking the wine and saying, this is my body, this is my blood of a new covenant. It's a new type of deal, no longer just with the, the flesh of these animals as a precursor sacrifice to the ultimate sacrifice that satisfies our God from taking away, for, for taking away our sin and our shame. But now it's, it's Jesus himself. He is the answer to this new covenant that is spoken of in Jeremiah. And there's, there's almost another level that is yet to come. A eternal peace between God and man that Jeremiah talks about. And we can only hope and we can only know this fully when we are with the Lord in heaven where no longer do people have to be reminded of who God is or what 
he is for us. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And how God deals with his people, it's summed up in that last phrase, that last sentence. I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. Two separate sides of a, of a similar coin that we get in our salvation that's paid for by Christ. Forgiving debt. Making it as if it didn't exist. Paying the price even though the one who is in debt, us, can't pay. That is this forgiveness. Every time we break a commandment every time we go our own direction all the things that psalm 119 that we confess that we want to be like when we fail to do that that's forgiveness of iniquity but then along with that forgiveness comes this this trust and this new way of god looking at his children not holding it over our head. Yeah, I forgave you guys all that, so I'm not going to let you out of my sight. No, he remembers our sin no more. It's not just that it's taken off the ledger. The books are clean. But there's an honest-to-goodness freedom and grace and really like it never happened between us and God. That is how our God plans to and does Look at his children because of the new covenant established in Christ. What a joy it is to have this kind of grace in our lives. And in our gospel lesson that we're going to hear now from Mark chapter 10, now we've got to figure out what to do with it. Not just between us and God, because that relationship is taken care of. Now how do we deal with it? amongst our brothers. How does our heart look at our new condition as forgiven, redeemed, our, our guilt forgotten, and us loved by God in such a way? How, how do we live out the remaining days? How do we look forward to heaven being as God's children? Mark chapter 10, it's an interesting uh, scenario that, <laughs> well, you can see humanity at work amongst the disciples. Let's put it that way for starters. I'll, I'll read it now. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism of, with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the other ten heard this, they began to be indignant at James and John. 
And Jesus called them to him, and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So where did James and John think they get off on this, huh? <laughs> I can't imagine being one of the other disciples and hearing that they made this request to Jesus. Now, they're still at the position in their time of following Jesus where they're not sure what it means to be at his right and at his left in his glory. They're expecting, at least part of them is expecting, that the Messiah, the King of Israel, is going to have a throne, probably a palace. The borders, like in the time of David and Solomon, are going to be established and maybe even expanding for the people of God in the nation of Israel. That it's going to be heaven on earth more than an earth that points to heaven. But that's not the way it's going to be. And so when Jesus says to these guys, you don't know what you're asking for, and talks about the cup that he has to drink and the baptism, the washing with which he needs to be washed, well, we know, because we have the blessing of looking back, the hindsight of the matter, we know that he talks about the cup he has to drink is that cup of wrath. And he prays to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he dies on that cross, if it be your will, Father, take this cup from me. That's the image in the back of church, if you're familiar with the stained glass window of Jesus in the garden. This image where he is looking at this spiritual cup, this, this wrath of God, not just the nails through his wrists and the thorns on his head and his breath expiring from his body, but the absolute wrath and anger and punishment. It's the fulfilling of that covenant that we just talked about in Jeremiah. The paying for that forgiveness for our account, our sins. He has to drink that cup of wrath and then be washed. The baptism, baptizo, this washing over. Well, that's a baptism that we really, we don't really want. This is something that James, who became a martyr, for the church and John who eventually lived out his life much longer in years but also died in uh, in a time of punishment for his faith they would drink that cup in a way they would experience the the baptism of the holy spirit working through them and suffer the consequences of being a faithful martyr for the faith as well but to be seated in glory what were they asking what moment was it that Jesus was thinking of that they weren't going to get? There's a couple of options here, and it's hard to say which one is the most true. You could think of heaven as that moment when Jesus has at his right and at his left the favored workers of the kingdom. People like Moses and Elijah, as they showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration, they would be prime candidates for this sort of position. James and John, really good guys, amazing work for the church. But do they fulfill that role? That's up to God to decide. The other option for this, it's much different than what James and John were thinking. Who is going to be placed? The word here is translated as seated, but you might also say, Who's going to hang out at the right and the left of Jesus when he comes into the moment of his absolute perfect glory? 
What does the glory of Christ, the Messiah, the one who pays for our sins, what does that moment of victory look like? Well, for us as humans, it looks like defeat. It looks like a moment of suffering. It is a moment of wrath being poured out, a moment of satisfaction for us, paid by the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It wasn't James on the cross to Jesus' right. It wasn't John at the cross to Jesus' left. That might have been what Jesus was talking about. In that moment of glory, that mysterious, strange, horrific glory that only God would seek, there were two criminals, one on his right and one on his left, one on his right, coming to his senses at the last moment with the help of the Holy Spirit, asking Christ to remember him. What a humbling moment. And that's what Jesus is really asking the disciples to consider. Not your own pride, being puffed up and seeking a place of honor. Not looking to be in charge of part of the kingdom yet to come. But a, a space and a place and a heart of humility. Of service. Of understanding what this new covenant, fulfilled by Christ, has done for you. So that, like the psalm earlier talked about our appreciation for God's law and his plan and his will, and so that this new covenant, which is going to be so readily on our hearts, and we gladly know who God is, so that if we are to be at the right hand or the left hand of Jesus, let it be out of service. Service to the cross. Service to our neighbors. Just like Jesus Right before that meal, when he establishes the new covenant on Monday, Thursday, we'll talk about this a little bit more. He does not sit high on the throne at that Passover celebration. He takes off his outer garments, taking the role of a servant, grabs a bowl of water and a cloth that became a dirty foot-drying towel, and proceeds to humbly clean off the feet of those who followed him. How can we serve the Lord? The answer is going to be different for everyone. How can we come into Holy Week with a heart of service and humility, appreciating for our own sake the cross of Christ, reveling in the joy of not only Palm Sunday, but also the empty tomb soon to come, but then, and for the remainder of our lives as God's people, looking around to see how we can help, how we can serve his kingdom. Yes, loving our neighbor, giving them what they need, and, and building them up as far as the physical goes, but even more importantly, for the purpose, so that all people will know Nobody else will have to be told who is God, what are his plans, what has he done. Rejoice in the fact that you know what he has done. Celebrate what is to come as we consider the cross and rejoicingly look around at the new life that has already begun for you as a servant of the Lord, knowing that eternal life already belongs to you. We praise God as we move along in our service and we sing our hymn for today. Obey my
Let's take this time now to confess our faith, joining together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in prayer. We pray. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your new covenant fulfilled through the blood of Jesus Christ. And not only has your plan and your love been shown to us, but we are able now with clean and pure hearts to better appreciate your plan to look upon your law as a good blessing in our lives, not just something that terrifies us and we can't live up to, but, a, but something that glorifies your name and helps us to point our servant hearts towards the cross so that others may know of your love as well. Be with your church, we pray, during this Lenten journey and as we move closer to Holy Week. Bless and preserve your church whether we are together or far apart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we ask that you would be merciful, that you would continue to walk alongside all of those who are sick, those who are suffering, those whose bodies are nearing death. It is a hard path. It is an uncomfortable path. You are the great physician, and it is your will to heal your children. And sometimes it is your will to call them home. And so we ask for your continued love and mercy. Lord, in that mercy, hear our prayer. Be with us in times of trouble. Walk with us during the remainder of this season. And keep us close to you as we pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so we go forth in this peace which God alone can give, a, a peace that the world has a hard time knowing, at least until they are known by Christ. 
So dear brothers and sisters, go forth in the knowledge that your sins have been forgiven. God has fulfilled his work and his covenant for you, and you are his child to life everlasting. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.